All the earth testifies of his glory, the songwriter say. They say our heart has a testimony, even our bones got a testimony. Hey, God. And they all testify that he's good, amen? We serve a great God. We serve a big God, amen? Glory. How many of y'all came in the house of the Lord to see God show up? How the song say? Show up. <laughs> hey, I can't sing it like he's singing, but God, I pray you show up in the house tonight, Father God. Father God, only you know what your people need, Father God. I pray that you would use me as a microphone to amplify your word, Father. I thank you for allowing us to be in the house on tonight. Bless your service, bind the enemy out, Father God, and let them see you, Father God, through a pure heart, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank y'all, brothers. Glory, glory. And so my mission, like I say every time I get up here, is to lift up the glory of God and to benefit his people somehow, amen? And long as those two things done, I'm going to sleep good tonight. Amen. And so as is our custom here at Philly, um, we first start off by lifting up the glory of our great God. We have a big God. He's not limited to anything. Anything that you need, the Bible says that all things are possible to those who believe. Sometimes the only limits are our beliefs. Amen. And so the reason we lift God up, though, lift God up because when we lift him up, he begins to do the drawing. Amen. When we begin to acknowledge him in all our ways, he begins to do the directing. Amen. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So God goes where he celebrated. How many people can celebrate God on tonight? Amen. Can we give him a hallelujah? Glory. Thank you, Father. But we also give honor to our past, amen, because, listen, we wouldn't know all that we know about the Lord if, this, if he wasn't up here serving and dropping jewels Sunday after Sunday, year after year, being faithful, amen. So we also give honor to our past, amen. But while I'm up here, I want to also give honor to my wife. The Bible says give honor where it's due. And so when I... <laughs> When I'm, when I'm not at work or working on a project, my wife give me the time to just sit with the Lord and, and glean a message, amen, and that's not easy with five kids. So, so I give honor where it's due. And Philly, I thank y'all. Seeing y'all face, y'all diligently seeking the Lord. If y'all wasn't here, we would, be, we would be preaching at the wall. Hey, we would still preach, but it would just be a little bit different, amen. It's good to see you, Brother Carl. It's good to see y'all, amen. Glory to God. And so... We're going to be wrestling again with our topic. We're going to be wrestling with the subject of honor, amen? But just because we talk about honor don't mean we're not going to talk about it. It's a lot in that. So we're not going to be talking just about honor. We're going to talk about a couple things. But we want to chew on that subject. Sometimes you got to chew on things a little bit to really get the nutrients out of it. You got to ruminate on some things. You got to tarry. You got to wrestle with some things in order for it to really bless you. You can't be quick to just rush past things because when you rush, you miss stuff. Amen? Amen? The Bible says contentment with godliness is great gain. That word contentment don't mean, it don't mean stagnancy. It means that what God has given us is enough to keep us busy. Amen? Y'all with me so far? Sometimes repetition is good for the soul. A little repetition, they say, is a pillar of learning. Amen? And so we're going to be doing a little bit of hard work tonight. And uh, like I tell my kids sometimes, this, this word is a sword. It's a double edge, right? And so sometimes it can seem like I'm swinging it at you, but I'm swinging it for you. I'm swinging it to, to, to swing it at a mindset that keeps the people of God bound, or I'm swinging it at a spirit that's empowering the mindset. Amen? And so somebody look at your neighbor and say, he's not swinging at you, he's swinging for you. Glory, 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 glory. 
And so we're going to be coming out of Mark 6, verses, uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 2 through 6, amen? And we're going to go ahead and read the word, amen? And the Bible says, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. We're talking about Jesus here. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And so they did all of this praising. They did all of this, wow, amazing. But then we come to the part where it says, and they were offended in him. Amen. But then Jesus had an answer for him. He said, Jesus said unto him, he said, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. And the Bible says he could do there, do no mighty work, save laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled at it. And he went around about the villages teaching. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this word. Father God, we bring our little two loaves of bread. And Father God, we pray that you would open it up again, Father God. We pray that you would give something for everybody. Father God, don't let nobody leave empty on tonight, Father God. We thank you for your word. And we thank you that you've already done it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a little, a little, little recap. On our first installment on this series, we talked about being so focused on man that we actually wind up missing God. Sometimes we could be so focused on the flesh that we miss what God is trying to do in the spirit, amen? And so we talked about that. And on our second installment on this series of honor, we talked about identifying love, right? Remember last time we talked about the house of darkness and the house of light. And we talked about how if you haven't seen things through the lenses of love, then you really haven't seen things as you ought to see it. Because everything is designed by love, for love, and through love. The Bible says God himself is love. Amen? And so tonight we're going to be talking about perceiving value. Amen? We wanted to start off with honor and value, but we want to first be able to perceive value. So we're going to be on the topic of perceiving value. And we get this from Mark 6, verse 4. We're going to focus on verse 4 where it says... A prophet is not without honor, but in his own, Jesus told him. Jesus is telling him, like a diamond retains value, so shall the prophet retain value. From generation to generation, the mouthpiece of God is going to retain value. Jesus is telling him off right here. But he said, except for in his own. And so that leads me to ask the question, if his value will be perceived, by who? Because he said, except for his own, right? So not everybody is going to be able to perceive the value, amen? So we're just going to be talking. This is kind of a step-by-step -step conversation, and we're going to discuss it in parts. Many times, you don't need to go situation to situation to find the value that you're looking for in life. You don't always need to hop to a new relationship. You don't always need to hop to a new job. You don't always need to hop to a new church, amen? Sometimes you just have to be able to perceive the value that God has already placed within your proximity, amen? Sometimes we overlook the value that God has already placed within our proximity. And so we want to talk about perceiving value because you can't chase after what you can't see, amen? You can't chase after what you can't see. And I love how the Bible says in Habakkuk, he says, write the vision and make it plain so that he that readeth it could run. And so he could run without fear of stumbling. Make it plain so he can be able to see the thing. Because how many of y'all know it's hard to run when you blindfolded? When you can't see. Amen. A lack of sight actually reduces or welcomes doubt. Amen? When people can't see, they begin to walk a little bit more timidly. They begin to want to just stand still. Amen? Because a lack of vision welcomes doubt. 
The Bible says without a vision, the people perish. Amen. They stumble over what they can't see. Amen. And so we see that vision is actually important, y'all. Sight is necessary. It's a necessary thing. Because if you can't see a thing, not only the sight of our eyes, but the sight of our heart, sight of our mind, the Bible says, let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. So, so not only with our eyes, but in able to produce things in life, you got to first be able to see it. Are y'all with me? Yes, sir. Before you build a house, you got to first have a vision. You got to have a blueprint for the, for the builders to see so they can be able to see it and then they could run with the vision. Amen. Anytime you write a movie, there needs to be a script. And it has to, the end has to be written from the beginning. Amen? And the actors have to be able to see the vision and run with it. Amen? You can't just throw parts together and expect to make an engine. You got to have a vision first. Amen? How many of y'all would sell y'all sight for $10,000? Who would sell their eyes for $10,000? million? Maybe? $2 million? Nobody. Right? Because it's with the eyes that we're able to perceive value. It's with the eyes that we see beauty. It's with the eyes that we spot opportunity. It's with the eyes that we even see danger. Amen? Amen. So we see that sight is important. And in order to honor value, you have to first be able to see it. Amen? And so the men in this text, they began to rebel against the word of God. They became angry with the word of God instead of rejoicing. Where there should have been a moment of rejoicing, they actually became angry. They said, wow, look at the mighty works of Jesus. And then right after the Bible says they were offended. Is that not backwards? Amen? So the men in the text who opposed Jesus, they were blinded by a spirit of greed and by a spirit of pride. Amen? They were rooted in unbelief. They couldn't even see what they was looking at. They couldn't even see who they was looking at. And it's not that they thought that Jesus did anything wrong. It's actually that they knew that he did something right. That's a word. If you ever got some haters out there, they're going to hate you one way or the other. Whether you do right, whether you do wrong, it don't really matter. Amen. And instead of submitting to the truth of God and, and correcting themselves, they just began to rebel. And the Bible talks about this in Romans 10, 3. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they went about to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted, submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. And it's important, y'all, because they came to God with a mind already made up about what they wanted him to do. All right, they wanted to see him move a certain way, and because he moved how they didn't expect him to move, they got upset with him. And this is a, neat, a, a note for us that never come to God with your mind already made up. Don't come to God with a stiff neck. If you want to hear from God, don't come with a stiff neck. Come with a malleable heart. Too many times we come to God not for approval, but we come to him for a cosign. We already got our bags packed. We got the flight booked, and we be like, God, this, okay? It's like, well, you don't need my approval. You're already halfway there, brother. You just need a cosign. A lot of times, that's what we come to God like, amen? Instead of renewing our mind, we try to renew God's mind. But we don't come with a malleable heart, and this is how these men in Scripture are doing with Jesus right now. And these men right here, we see they overlook the most value that the world has ever seen. In this moment, they look in God in the eyes, and they can't see who they're looking at because they blinded by unbelief. Amen? Amen? And Jesus is like, it's cool. If y'all can't see my value, a prophet will not be without honor. If y'all don't see my value, somebody will. I'm going to just go to another town. It's okay. He wasn't bothered by it. But at the end, though, he stopped and he just marveled at their unbelief. He was like, man, y'all see this? Not that he was surprised, though. It's that he wanted us to take note of the mystery of unbelief. How people can see so much, but still see nothing at all. They didn't see nothing at all, y'all. And I want to tell you, this is a dangerous thing. And we see here, we can see that 
the, the root of dishonor is actually rooted in unbelief. Because yes. after they did all their dishonoring and stuff, he just went off on the side and marveled at their unbelief, the Bible says. So this is actually a manifestation of unbelief. Yes. Amen? And I want to tell us in our own personal lives, the main thing that will cause you to overlook value in your life is unbelief. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. But what's a biblical definition of unbelief? Let me tell you what unbelief is. It's refusing or neglecting to acknowledge the truth or the reality that God has revealed. Amen? I'm going to say that one more time because I want us to catch it now. Refusing or neglecting to acknowledge the reality that God has revealed. I want you all to keep a mental note of that. Because any beliefs that cause you to oppose the word of God, it's a bad belief. Any beliefs that cause you to begin to twist the truth of God's word, that's a bad belief. Amen. Anytime you look at light and you label it darkness, anytime you look at truth and you label it evil, anytime you look at right and then you interpret it as wrong, that's a bad belief. All right. And, and, and not just a bad belief. I say bad belief or polluted beliefs, but really is just another form of unbelief. Amen? It's all unbelief. And what's so bad about unbelief is that we see the world through our beliefs. Yes. All right? How we process the world that we interact in with is through our belief system. Amen? And so when we get stuck in unbelief, it blocks us from seeing reality as it is. We can't see no more. All right? The Bible says, it's with the heart that man believes. And so we see with our heart, but our beliefs are the lenses that sit on our heart. Some people call it the, our world view because it's, it's what we view our world through, amen? Through our belief system. Y'all with me? Yes. Two people could look at one situation and see two different things because they have two separate belief systems. We don't even see ourselves as we are. Amen. We see ourselves as we believe ourselves to be. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So how we see ourselves has more to do with our thinking than our eyes. Amen. So we don't only see with our eyes, we also see with our heart. And we see through our beliefs. Amen. So what happens when our belief system or the lens that we look at reality through, what happens when that lens becomes distorted or polluted? everything begins to look polluted. Amen, it's a dangerous thing. Everything begins to look polluted. When we look at the world, we start to look at the world through something the Bible calls an evil eye, amen? We begin to look at the world through an evil eye. And what is an evil eye? Let's explain that. An evil eye is when a, when a spirit of greed hijacks your heart or a spirit of depression, or a spirit of anger hijacks your heart and causes you to see reality through his, its lens. Amen? And it distorts your ability to believe God. Amen? Y'all with me? We see our, our first example of that in Genesis with, with Eve. The devil comes to her and he says, has God really said? God knows that in the day you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like God's knowing the difference between good and evil. And the Bible says Eve began to see. She began to see that the, the, the fruit was good to make one wise, that it was good for this and that. But she began to see through an evil eye. Amen. She getting revelation from Satan himself. Yes, sir. Amen. It's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. And it says... We're going to look at, we're going to give some scriptural examples too. But we see that Eve right here, I want to tell you that when the seed of the word does not take root, the devil is coming to pluck that thing up. And when he plucked that thing up, he's going to trap you in unbelief. Amen? All right, so we have to be careful. It's a serious thing. So I'm going to give us some scriptural examples of what I'm talking about. In Matthew chapter 6, 23, he says, But if thine eye be evil... Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If your eyes is just focused on evil continually, then your whole being is going to be full of darkness. If you're just a negative Nancy, always looking for what somebody doing wrong, 
You're going to be full of darkness. And so you got to be careful not to become polluted by an evil eye. He says, if the light, therefore, that is in you be darkness, then how great is that darkness? If the illumination that you're receiving is from darkness, then how great? We see Eve is taking revelation from the devil. Amen? She didn't know these things before, and so the devil put a... He gave her revelation, but if that light that's in you be darkness, the Bible says, how great is that darkness? Amen? In Proverbs 28, 22, he says, he that hasteneth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. And so the Bible is saying, he that's rushing to get rich, he's looking at life through a spirit of greed. He got a distorted lens, and he's not seeing reality as God intended him to see it. And he don't consider that poverty is coming. You know the world loves people that love to get rich quick. That's why we have get rich quick schemes, so they can separate them from their money, amen? When they don't believe or see the truth of God, because the word of God tells us in Proverbs 13, 11, it says, wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. But wealth from hard work grows over time. But if you see, (laughs) glory, if you see the world through God's eyes, you wouldn't be trapped by the enemy and through an evil eye. Are y'all hearing me out there? Amen. And so we see that an evil eye actually causes us it causes us not to see reality as it is. And I love this story right here in the Bible. There was a master of a vineyard, and he was just feeling generous one day. And he just went around seeing who, who needed to, to, to get some work, amen? He needed to see who to put to work. And so he was riding around, he saw some guys, and he was like, here, y'all come work in my vineyard. I'm going to pay y'all, let's say, $100, amen? And he put them to work. And then he went out again that day, and he saw some other people. He's like, why y'all just standing on the corner? Here, I'm going to hire y'all and let y'all go to work in my vineyard. And he saw another group, and he was like, listen, why are y'all standing out here? Listen, come work in my vineyard. I'm going to pay you. And so at the end of the day, when everybody got paid, some of the, some of the people that worked earlier in the day, they began to say, man, why y'all got as much money as us? Why we all got the same amount? We've been out here working all day. Ah, oh, this ain't right. Oh, no, the master, he need to give us some more money. And the man overheard him, and he said, cool, y'all. I didn't have to put you to work in the first place. What did he say? Let's look at what he say in Matthew 20, 15. He said, is, not, uh, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own money? Did I break a law in being generous to y'all? He said, is thine eye evil because I'm good? Did you look at what I just did right and through a greedy eye, begin to call it evil? You're twisting reality. You're seeing things through the wrong lens. You're looking at this through an evil eye. We got to be careful of this thing, because if you drink through a dirty straw, then the drink is going to become dirty too, yeah. It's going to become polluted, amen? And so if you look at the world through a distorted lens, everything is going to start to look distorted, all right? If you begin to look at things out of context, you're going to begin to deal with things out of context. He was dealing out of context, amen? He didn't really see what was going on. And the Bible says in Titus 1, uh, verses 15, he says, unto the pure, all things are pure. When your heart is clean, you just see things as they are, amen? You You don't try to add nothing to it or take nothing away from it. Unto the pure, all things are pure, the Bible says. But he says... But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Everybody got a devil. You got a devil, you got a devil. (laughs) Everything is defiled, and not because everybody got a devil. It's because they mind probably got a devil. (laughs) You understand? They're looking at everything through a polluted lens. The Bible says, he says, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So the problem isn't with everybody else. It's with them. They see a devil in everybody else, but they can't see God in nobody. It's a problem. It's a problem. But the vice versa is true. When the lens is clean, clarity becomes increased. Amen? 
And that's, a, that's our intended state of being. God wants us to be able to see things as they are, not through a polluted lens. Amen? And clarity is our natural state of being. God wants us to even see him through a pure heart. The Bible says what? It says, it says, let's look at it. It says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure at heart, for they shall see. When they ain't got no clutter in the way, those are the ones that's going to see, he says. And what they going to see? They going to see God. Amen. They going to begin to see God in everything. Amen. Because everything testifies of the glory of God. Everything carries a testimony. We just heard our bones got a testimony of his glory. Amen. So we're going to begin to look at everything and be able to see his glory because it all testifies of him. Amen. Y'all still with me? So seeing properly gives us the ability to give a proper response. And a proper response should always be our natural response. Amen? Amen? I tell my kids this all the time. If you see something fall on the floor, remember, this is your house. You should pick it up. That should be your natural response. If that's not your natural response, it's telling me we got a problem. Because you're either looking at it through a spirit of laziness or you're looking at it through a spirit of pride. Like, well, I didn't drop it. I don't got to pick it up. That's how we got a problem, amen? We're going to have a problem. And so when you see him properly, you're going to be able to give a proper response. And I, I, I love the this, this story Jesus told with the wicked servant. Uh, the wicked servant said, I knew that you reap where you don't sow. And I knew you was a hard man, so I, I, just, I just hid it. I hid your talents right here so you can go get it. And the master said, well, if you really believe that, the proper response would have been to at least put my money somewhere where it gains interest. But because you actually looking at this thing through an evil eye and you polluting reality to your own benefit, give me my money back and give it to the person who can see correctly. And he called them a wicked servant. He said, you wicked. Jesus had the same thing too. He, he sent off 10 lepers, right? And, and he said, go show yourself to the priests, all right? And along the way, they began to be healed. And then one of them said, man, this has to be the glory of God. This has to be God. Nobody could do this. And so he decided to turn back and go worship God. And Jesus was like, man, didn't I heal 10? Is there only one that came back to give a proper response to the glory of God? But we remember Jesus, the one that told them, go show themselves to the priests. So that should tell you. Sometimes we use the word to deny his spirit, amen? To disobey what the spirit of God tells us. Sometimes we, this is what the Pharisees do. They use the word to resist the spirit. And Jesus, he ain't new on the block. He, he key to it, amen? And so this is why we have to begin to transform our mind, the Bible says, or renew our mind and, 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 and begin to look at things through God's worldview and not ours, amen? Because when we can't see proper, we can't engage properly. When you see things the wrong way, you're going to deal with things the wrong way. When, God, when the hand of God is trying to plant you in a certain place, you're going to think through a distorted lens, God is trying to bury you. And then you're going to climb out of the place where God planted you, and you're going to ruin your future, uh, 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 your ability to produce fruit. Amen? That makes sense. Yes, Sometimes when God is trying to water you in a season, you're going to think God trying to drown you. Amen. And you're going you're gonna to stop the process and then you're going to wither up in your season and you're not going to be able to produce fruit. Amen. Sometimes when God is trying to purify us, we think he's trying to burn us to a crisp. Amen. Because we're not looking at his hand through a pure lens. We see this with Esau. Esau... He saw, I said, I just want something to eat. He, he, couldn't see, he couldn't see the value of his birthright. He couldn't perceive the value that God had gave him. Amen. And for, his, for, for a, a, a moment of pleasure, he gave his future away. He gave his whole future away. And sometimes we get like that 
we, uh, in, spite, in, 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 in light of our present circumstances, we pass up the opportunity for a better future, amen, just because it don't feel good or it don't look good. I know pastor said it like this one time. Anybody desire to be homeless? No, right? All right. How many of y'all would be homeless for a week if they gave you $2 million at the end of it? I see some of y'all thinking, I'll be the first one to sign up. For the $2 million, I'll go through that week. Amen? <laughs> because listen, it's the hope of a better future that causes you to change how you look at your present circumstances. And so, if you really believe the word of God and the hope that he's spoken over your future, it should change how you look at your present circumstance. Amen? You shouldn't look at it the same because of the hope that you have. Amen? We shouldn't go through like the world go through. In Hebrews 12, 2, he says, because of the joy awaiting Jesus, he endured the cross. He endured wicked men, the Bible says. And, and, and it, it even says this, it says, and so don't worry when you become uh, uh, weary. He said, don't become weary and don't give up by focusing on the example that Jesus laid down, amen? amen. And so it's important to be able to renew our minds, to begin to reset our minds uh, and not look at things through our mind, but begin to look at things through God's mind. God desires us to look at things through his mind. Amen. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. He's saying, place all your heart in the Lord, but lean not unto your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and allow him to direct. Amen. He said, be not wise in your own eyes. Amen. So God wants us to see things not through our eyes, but through his eyes. God wants us to see reality the way he intended us to see it. But sometimes we have a polluted lens and we can't really see things how God intended us to see it. But God has an infatuation with us looking at things through his mind. In Philippians 2, 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, 15, verse 16, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. He's given us his mind to see things through. He don't want us to just see things through our mind. In the days of Noah, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And they began to pollute their ways. And the Bible says their minds was continually wicked to the point where he had to destroy everything. But in Moses... He gave Israel the ability to look at creation through his mind. He gave them the law of Moses so they can have a glimpse of his heart and what he actually intended things to be so that we could know that we have an expected end and that he wasn't out to hurt us but to give us an expected end and his heart towards us was as the heart of a father is to a child. Amen? And so he gave us his heart so we didn't continue to pollute our ways on the earth. I want y'all to imagine this with me for a second. Give me your imagination for a second, amen? I like to talk in pictures sometimes because I want y'all to, I want y'all to not just hear a bunch of information, but I want y'all to see it because when you see it, you ain't gonna forget it, amen? Let's imagine that God gave Israel a pair of glasses that allowed them to see his hand throughout creation, that allowed them to see when he lifted up one person and put another one down, when he was saying, go left instead of right, amen, when he was saying, uh, uh, or they allowed them to see his promises and, the, and how to access his promises. These glasses even gave them the ability to see the Messiah, the, the great physician who was to come and restore all sight, amen? But half of Israel put the glasses in their pocket. Imagine half of Israel just put the glasses in their pocket because they didn't perceive the value of what they had. They put it in their pocket and they began to use the glasses for profit for themselves, amen, instead of putting it on. But the other half of Israel began to put on the glasses. They began to put it on and they, they, they began to perceive reality and the day when the Messiah came, they saw, they was able to recognize him. And they came to him, and they received the fullness of sight. Amen? But as they received the fullness of sight, they began to realize 
that the glasses was a temporary fix. So they began to take off the glasses because, like the Bible said, the law is not made for a righteous man. Amen. They began to take off the, the old and they began to operate in the new. Amen. But those who was making profit off of the glasses, they got upset and they began to attack the people who took off their glasses. Amen. But they couldn't mix the two because when you try to put reading glasses on 2020 vision, you're going to mess it up. Amen. And so they began to attack and they persecuted the people who no longer needed glasses. But they killed the great physician. Amen. And all of this they did because they couldn't perceive the value of what God was trying to do in their life. Amen. They couldn't see because they was blinded by their greed. This was Israel. They was blinded and stuck in unbelief. And they killed their own provision. Amen. And so I don't want this to happen to us. Amen. That's why I'm warning us about unbelief. It's a dangerous thing, y'all. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 3.12. He says, take heed, brethren. Least there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, because out of this thing flows the issues of your life. You gotta, you gotta guard this thing. Because he asks, he says, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Who didn't enter into the promise of God? Was it not those who refused to believe? And so we see that because of unbelief, they couldn't enter in. The Bible says this. He says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? Y'all, this is, this is important to God. This is why beliefs are important to God. So we have to begin. It's an important thing to renew our minds. Amen. It's only the reality that you believe that you're going to operate in in life. It's only the reality that you believe because we can't, we can't process beyond our beliefs. Your body can't go nowhere that your mind has never been. Amen? And so it's important because we cannot, like a computer cannot process anything beyond its programming. If you put an iPhone next to an a Android, they won't even recognize each other because it's beyond the programming. And in the same way, y'all, we can't see beyond our beliefs. We don't only see with our eyes. Again, remember, we see with our heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so this is why it's such a big deal to God. Unbelief is such a big deal. Amen? And so your ability to believe is your ability to see. And I want to show y'all a formula in the scripture so that we can apply this. I come to give practical things that we can use in our everyday life, amen? So I wanna show you something in the scripture. In order, you first have to believe the word of God to be able to perceive the hand of God. And once you perceive the hand of God, then you will be able to align yourself with the will of God. And once you align yourself with the will of God, then you're going to receive the promises of God. It's a, it's a systematic formula, y'all. It's a systematic formula, and I want y'all to, 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 to take note of that. Believe, perceive, achieve, and receive. Amen? And I want to show it to y'all in Scripture. I want to first show y'all a negative example of it because this is somebody who almost missed the promise, all right, due to unbelief. All right, y'all remember the leper who went to the prophet? He went to the prophet and he had his mind made up about how God was supposed to do all the things and come out and, and kind of honor him and whatnot. And he came and the prophet just said, uh, tell him, go wash yourself in the pool seven times. I'll go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times, amen? And he got upset and he was like, how he gonna disrespect me like this? What are, what are you talking about? And he was looking at the situation through an evil eye of pride. But his, his friend that was with him noticed, he said, hey, man, if he, if he had did something that spoke to your pride, would you, would you have not done it? He said, why don't you just do it? We already here. And he had a good friend that helped him correct his belief system so that could, he could perceive that he was out of order, amen? 
he realized, man, I'm tripping. And so now that he believed, he was able to perceive what to do. And then he was able to align himself with the will by going to the Jordan. And when he aligned himself, he was able to receive the promise. Amen. And so we got to be careful because just like unbelief almost caught him slipping, it catches a lot of us in our life, y'all. We don't even perceive the hand. We don't even see that we even missed his hand. We don't even see that God was trying to bless us in that moment. Amen. But we were stuck in unbelief. It's not that God didn't show up. Like the song say, he showed up. Amen. But we didn't even see him. He said, let not a double-minded man think that he's going to receive anything from God. Because even if God sent it, he ain't going to be able to, to perceive that it even happened. Amen. And the Bible says it's not, that, it's not that your sins have hidden you from me. It's that your sins have hidden my face from you. You can't perceive my movements. It's not, it's, not, it's not that I can't reach you. I've been here the whole time. I love this quote. It says, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that God hasn't been here the whole time, but we have to learn how to be able to perceive value because we overlook so many things in life. Amen? Another example of this is with Joseph, all right? He believed through a, through a troubled king. He heard the word of God, and he believed the word of God. Amen? And so when the seven years of plenty came, he started to perceive the hand of God. And then he was able to align himself with the will of God by saving money off a side. And so by the time the seven years of famine came, y'all familiar with this story? I know this is the Tuesday crowd. These are the ones who seek the Lord <laughs> regardless. Amen? And so uh, when the famine came, he was able to receive the blessing. I want y'all to remember these steps. It's believing the word of God allows you to perceive the hand of God. And then you will be able to align yourself with the will of God so that you can receive the promise of God. Amen? Does that make sense? Joseph, because he believed the word, y'all, he was able to tap 14 years into the future. The mind of God is timeless. I don't think we perceive the value of what we have some days. He wasn't bound by time. He was able to tap 14 years in the future and see what to do. You know, the world would kill for this type of technology. But we have it in the Bible. It gives you the ability to see beyond the present time. Uh, in Luke 24, 25, Jesus says, Oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Should not Christ have suffered and been crucified? If you would have believed my word, you should have been able to perceive what the future held. Jesus was mad at them because they couldn't see the future. This word gives you the ability to see things you ought to not know. But I'm trying to help us perceive the value of what we have, amen? Because when you believe what I said, then you should be able to perceive what I said, amen? If I say, man, listen, you know my cousin still. <laughs> and so if we come to your house and my cousin just disappear, I shouldn't have to say nothing. You should be able to perceive what I didn't say by what I did say, if you believe me, amen? I like this story. When we're getting close to the end of it, y'all, I like this, this, this movie, uh, Back to the Future. And, and the little boy travels back to the past, amen, and he gets stuck in the past, and he can't get back to the future. But he was trying to figure out how to build this machine to get back home. And so the professor comes to him, and he says, 31 gigawatts. But then he disappears, and he, go, he, he could only stay in the past for so much time. And, uh, the, the boy is trying to figure out a way, but he can't figure out the solution to the problem he's dealing with. And then all of a sudden, he remembered 31 gigawatts. That's it. Because he believed the word, regardless of what the man didn't say, he was able to perceive what it meant without instruction. Amen? And this is what I'm saying about the word. When you believe his word, 
you're going to begin to perceive things that other people can't see. Amen? If you wonder how pastor get up here and that word break open like transformers and the whole world come out of that thing, this is how. You have to believe it. Believe what he said, and then you're going to begin to perceive what he didn't say. Amen? Because he expects you to give a proper response for what he didn't tell you. Amen? That was with the wicked servant. He didn't give him no instructions. He expected a proper response. Hey, God, is this helping anybody? We almost to the end of it, y'all. And so we have to begin to take off a carnal mind. We got to take off a carnal mind because it's going to block us from seeing the movements of God. Because the problem when we look at the promises of God is that his promises, his promises are like upside down <laughs> to a carnal mind, right? The Bible says that a carnal mind is enmity with God. It's a pro- so when you look at him from a carnal mind, everything is going to look upside down when it's actually right side up. Yes. Carnality is unable to profit from God's ways. The Bible says in John uh, 6, uh, verse 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. They are life, amen? And all we have to do is just believe. In Mark 9, 23, it says, Jesus said unto them, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe, amen? All things are possible. And so God desires us to actually value everything that he's placed in our life. Because sometimes seasons change and you don't really, you can't even perceive the value that you actually have in this season. Everything is made beautiful in this season, the Bible says. And if you don't know how to perceive things out of season or perceive value, you're going to pass up some things. Because them children, you might be playing on the phone, ignoring them children now, but one day they're going to get older, and they're going to be playing on the phone, ignoring you, and you need help. Sometimes seasons change, and you don't realize the value of what you have until they walk away. Amen? Until seasons change. But God expects us to value everything that we have. He gives us a tree. He gives us a tree, but we have to be able to perceive the value to make a house here. Some people in here sitting next to your breakthrough, but you never even perceive the value to begin to get to know them. You never know what you're sitting next to, amen? Because this is the truth about it. And we wrapping up. God says he's given you everything you need according to life and godliness. Now, how many people have spotted everything in their life that they need? Not everybody, amen? And so there's some things we need to begin to start looking and seeing. Hey, brother, what's your name? Because God has already given me everything I need. I just need to get out here and perceive where he placed it. Amen? Sometimes we overlook the value that he's given us. Amen? Have we fully appreciated the value that we have in Jesus? Amen? Have we fully appreciated the value he's given us? Have we fully appreciated the joy of our salvation? The Bible says his grace is new every morning. If you're not excited about this thing, then you probably miss something, amen? It's most likely you miss it, because this thing that we have in Jesus is exciting, amen? It's exciting, his grace is new every day. And he's the jewel that's worth trading everything. He's the hidden treasure that's worth trading everything, amen? And so we're about to wrap it up. And listen, if y'all want to, if you want to begin to see the value that God has placed in your life, if you want to begin to look out and perceive the things that God has placed for you, amen, we're going to go ahead and we're going to pray, amen. We're going to pray that this word sticks, Lord, and we're going to pray that we begin to see God's hand in our life when we become rooted in belief, amen. Lord, we thank you for today, Father God. We thank you for your word. It was quick, but Father God, I think it was meaningful, Father God. I I pray that this word would stick. I pray that it would take root, that the enemy would not pluck it up, Father God. We know that the devourer follows the sower, Father God. 
But Father God, I pray that you would protect this word and cause it to germinate, Father God, and that, Father God, season after season, faith to faith, Father God, that, that, that you would water this seed until the day it pops up and reveals its true self in their heart, Father God. We thank you for this Bible study, Father God, and we thank you for time in you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, glory. Amen. We got out of here early tonight, y'all. Glory, glory, glory. And listen, if there's anybody in the house, I'm sorry, that want to give their life to the Lord and, 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 and begin to switch the way they think, y'all can pray this sinner's prayer with me. I want to do that to make sure. We don't want to miss an opportunity to bring souls to the Lord. Amen. I, don't, I want to perceive the value of the opportunity right now. Say, Lord, we admit that our ways aren't always right, Father. But we confess that your ways are right, Father. And we declare you as Lord of our life. God, give us a new heart to be able to see your hand, God. Save our souls, renew our minds, and strengthen our spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Glory. Thank you, brother. Oh.